This morning we are going to be looking at the Lord's Supper. We will start in the book of Acts, as Eugene mentioned. We've been going through the book of Acts for a while now. And I'm going to skip ahead, though, slightly past Pentecost, because we're not there yet in our calendar. Um, but also I want to skip to right after Pentecost as the church is born. So we're going to actually start in Acts chapter 2 at the very end of Acts chapter 2. So let's pray, and then let's read from the Scriptures. God, we thank you so much that we can be together in person, and for those who can be online, we just pray, Father, that you would guide us, that you would give us wisdom today, hearts that would understand, ears that would hear, minds to comprehend all that you have for us, that we might be wowed again by your sacrifice for us, and by not only the fact that you are willing to suffer, but by the power that is in your death and resurrection that bonds us together, that unites us, that makes us a family, that creates in us as new creatures, that we are born again because of what you have done, Father, that we are able to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit. May we be, Father, just found afresh in that today. May we be in awe of you again as we are able to come together with brothers and sisters and sit together and sing together. Um, may we be reminded that we are only here because of you and that we will always be together because of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. I've realized just from doing the opening I'm going to have to retrain myself because I keep just wanting to look at the camera because I haven't had anybody else to look at in weeks. So I'm going to try not to just look there but to see you all as well today. At first it was terrible, I just wanted to look at all the empty seats, and now I just want to look at the camera. So it's amazing how quickly we adapt. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42, is after we've already had the day of Pentecost, after Peter has preached, thousands have been added to the church, and we read this, such an encouraging passage here at the end of the chapter. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, speaking of the Christians, those who were followers of Jesus, who had put their faith in him, and the fellowship to the breaking of bread, which we'll be doing today, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. So sharing with each other, they're a family. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So it's an amazing chapter in the church's life. This is before the persecution starts. Much of what we read in the New Testament, there's this time of persecution, the Roman Empire. We have Paul and Silas being whipped and all these stories of difficulty and people being martyred. But here at the beginning, they're finding favor throughout Jerusalem. They're taking care of widows and the poor, and they're, they're just a blessing to their entire community. And they are being blessed as they come together, as they are united, as they follow Christ, and as they put each other's needs ahead of their own, as they are praying, as they are breaking bread, the church is born. Jesus said, and we talked about this last week, that his church, his ecclesia, his called out ones, right? He's going to build it up and the gates of hell won't stand against it. What would it have been like to be there in the shoes of Peter and the other disciples who had been in Caesarea Philippi? The passage we looked at last week, when they're looking at the gates of hell, where they're doing the sacrifices to Pan, not them, but the other people are doing sacrifices to Pan, and they're seeing all the people worshiping the false gods, and Jesus says, I'm going to build a church. The gates of hell won't stand against it. And then, not too much later, here they are, and thousands are worshiping Christ. They must have felt just over the moon. They must have felt so excited and empowered. But yes, this, we see the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. These humble fishermen and others who had come together, and day by day, and they're just, they must have been, as it says, in awe. Now, one of the things I think is so key from this passage, one person is not the church. It is manifested in our community. Now, I understand that each one of us has an individual relationship with Christ, but we are the church and that we are the body of Christ. If we see a body part, a hand laying on the floor, as grotesque as that sounds, we don't go, there's a body, we say there's a part. But it's the whole body. Jesus says, where two or more are gathered, there I am with you. There's something about us coming together, about our community and unity in Christ. And so here, the church is born. The ecclesia, those who were called out, 
and able to vote to make decisions about the, the city. Well, one person wasn't the ecclesia, they were part of it, but it needed the whole group or a substantial portion to be an ecclesia, to be a called out group that was able to make decisions. And so as a body, now it's challenging because sometimes it's not easy working together with other Christians. Sometimes it can be a little bit draining. I've known many pastors who want to lead their people, but they just, they want to get after it, and they feel like the people are holding them back, and there's this tendency to say, well, I'm just going to get after it. And we have to say, well, if you get after it and you leave everybody behind, you're not leading anymore. I can imagine how Moses and, and Joshua felt when they were ready to enter the promised land, but the children of Israel refused. God could have given the promised land to Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, but yet they had to stay with the people and take time until the people were ready. Even though the people were sinful, leading, it's something we do, it's something we do as a group, and our journey is as a group and a fellowship. And so even as a church, we're on a journey together. And even though it may be frustrating or difficult at times, we're here to sharpen each other. We're here to have fellowship so we can drive each other on to good works and to love, and to see the fruit of the Spirit manifest, to hold each other accountable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for encouragement, to rejoice with each other and to mourn with each other when appropriate. That takes being in community. And the picture that we have and that we'll do in a few minutes of the Lord's Supper is this unity we have in Christ, that Christ is one. But as he broke the bread, as he broke himself apart and spread it, each of them got a piece of him, and so out of the many was one. He gathered such different people, and in the end, people from different nations, people from other we get Jews and Gentiles, all of us, different languages, from different generations, and he gathers all of us together as we share in his body, the one body, we are united in him. There is one Christ, there's one Lord, there's one Spirit, there's one God. And we have unity with him because of his death and his resurrection. But each of us is not the church on our own. We are part of that body of Christ. He is the one. And so we need one another. Sometimes I hear people saying, well, I, I don't think I need anything from others. Well, then maybe God wants you to give something to others. Because we grow not only in what we receive, but also in how we serve. And so for those who find themselves at a point of maturity saying, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to get out of participating in this or that. I say, well, yes, but what, is, what do other people get out of you participating uh, the question we ask ourselves should not always be, because this is, it's become a, a twisted sense of consumerism in the church today. It should not always be, what do I get out of it? Yes, I want you to get something out of being at church. You should get something out of it. We need to be concerned about our own spiritual growth. But it's also, what am I putting into it? What is God calling me to do as a part of this body, as a part of this community? And so as we come together, as they came together, the church was born this ecclesia that Christ had foretold, that had promised. And we see this beautiful picture. But sadly, it doesn't take very long. It's some years later. But before there's sickness in the church and there's difficulties. And when we come to the story of the Lord's Supper, I often use 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as our text. And I don't usually talk about the difficulties in Corinth. We just use the text that Paul gave us as we take and, and celebrate Christ's death and remember what he's done for us. But the reality is Paul was bringing correction because the church was sick in Corinth. Things weren't going well. So we flip over to 1 Corinthians. We can go through a few different passages today. But chapter 11, starting in verse 17, he says to them, Paul's writing, he says, but in the following instructions I do not commend you. So the instructions are what I always read to us. But the instructions are not a commendation. The instructions are a correction of here's, how, here's what this is all about. And these instructions here are you're getting it wrong. He says, because when you come together, it is not for the better but for the worse. Now, this is not good. You see, as we come together as a church, it should be for the better. For the better of each of us. For the better of the witness of Christ to our community, to those around us. As a proclamation of God's goodness to the forces of evil. But what was happening in Corinth, when they came together, the witness of Christ was hurt. Now, do you remember what, John, what Jesus said that John recorded in John 13? He said, they'll know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. But here in Corinth, they didn't seem to have any love for each other. I'm not saying that nobody loved each other, but the way they acted was not in love. 
Of course, it's not long after this that Paul gives instruction in what we call the love chapter in chapter 13, because this was a serious deficit in the church in Corinth. And so as they came together, it actually hurt the witness of Christ. He says, for in the first place, he's going to get specific. When you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. He's being gracious. He's hearing there's cliques, there's different groups, and they're not accepting one another. He says, I believe it in part. He understands that what he is hearing may not be the whole truth. There's always multiple stories, and maybe there are some that are better than others in how they're acting. But he's saying it must be true in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now, of course, they're thinking it is. They're taking the Lord's Supper. They're calling it that. But he says, for an eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. So they're having a full meal here as communion, and yet some are, and we don't know all the specifics. It's probably some of the wealthy people who had brought more food, and they said, well, I brought things. I should go first. And by the time they're all done, there's no food left for those who could not contribute. It's like having a potluck. And then they have wine to celebrate what Jesus has done, but instead of drinking it and remembering what Christ has done, they are drinking it and drinking it and drinking it and getting drunk and reveling. And he says, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So here again, we see the lack of love, and we see such a juxtaposition, such an opposite between Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, and here in 1 Corinthians. In Acts, we see this beautiful picture of how the church should behave. And in Corinth, we see this awful picture of what the church can become. And so the church is sick here, and it's not where we want to be. We want to be more like the church in Acts, not, of course, the church in Corinth, where people are being put to shame in the name of Christ is being put to shame. It also reminds us that we can do, go through the motions of serving God and yet still not please God. God looks at the heart, not just the outside. But I want to take us back a step here. Because here we have this instructions on communion and the next verses here that Paul says are what we'll read in a few minutes when we take communion. But I want to go back in time. Back all the way to the first covenant that I think begins to give us a peek at where communion is going to come from. And that's back, of course, in Genesis. My clay, there we go. Genesis 15. And in Genesis chapter 15, we have the covenant with Abraham. I'm just going to read a few verses. We're not going to go through the whole one because we have quite a few verses to go through. But I'm going to give you the overview of kind of this picture of God and his covenant relationship with Abraham and his descendants who we are counted with. We're counted with his descendants. Maybe you learned the song when you were younger. Father Abraham has many sons and I am one of them and so are you. So we are counted in this, in a, in a way, um, we are a part of this family and the covenant with Abraham and the family of Abraham starts here in chapter 15, starting in verse 5. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So God says, Look, see how many stars there are? I'm going to make your descendants like that. And Abraham believed. And that faith, God counts to him as righteousness. Not because Abraham was a perfect man. Abraham made plenty of mistakes, had plenty of sin in his life. But he was a man after God's own heart, and he was a man who believed the Lord. Hebrews 11 tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Verse 7, God says to Abraham, or Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. So here is God telling Abram that I'm going to make your descendants like the stars. There are going to be so many of them. And I'm going to give this land to them. So this is a promise for Israel, ultimately. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob changed his name to Israel. There's, there's other steps in here we're skipping over. But it's a promise for Israel, but it's also a promise for us. Because we have become co-inheritors with Israel. As what Christ did was not simply for the people who were blood-related to Abraham, but rather for those who are a family of the faith, of those who put their trust in what Christ has done. 
And so, as Romans says, not all Israel is Israel. In other words, there are those who are part of the nation by blood whose faith is not in Christ and are not receivers of the ultimate promise that God was initiating here with Abram. And there are others of us who have no roots with the Jewish nation, who have no DNA tying into Abram, and yet we are inheritors and part of the nation of Israel in that we are those who are part of God's family. So after that, we go up to Passover, Exodus chapter 12. So Abram has this promise. He raises Isaac, and Isaac raises Jacob. And you know about Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob's name is changed to Israel by God. And then they, Joseph goes to Egypt. They all go to Egypt. They're living in Egypt quite well. But after a while, after Joseph dies, the Egyptians enslave all the Israelites. And for 430 years, there they are. They're spending all this time in slavery. And of course, God raises up Moses, who comes in to rescue them. And towards the very end of them being rescued, God brings the Passover, where God is going to pass over the land. And the firstborn in each family is going to die, unless he sees the blood of the Lamb. And so we read in Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, Roast on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So here we have a picture of Passover, of how it's going to be conducted. There's more instructions, but we do see the, the clear connection to communion that we are taking, where we have the, the drinking here of the wine as well as the eating with the, uh, with the flat bread, with the unleavened bread. Now, we don't have any lamb because Christ is the lamb, and so we don't have uh, an actual physical lamb anymore because that's not needed. That was pointing towards Christ. So the Passover is something that's instituted, and for the next 1,500 years, the Jewish people celebrated it, well, religiously. Something they did every year. It was the biggest feast. It was so important to them because they were able to look back and say, look what God has done. Look how he saved us from our toil, from our slavery, how he rescued us, how he set us up as a nation. That Psalm 113 they would likely read at the beginning of their Passover celebration, praising God and, and how He's glorious, how He's raised them up. And they looked back and they remembered that. And today we use communion to look back and remember what Christ has done for us, rescuing us from our slavery to sin. So very much in the same spirit as Passover, it's something that's a celebration we do on a regular basis to remind ourselves, to remind one another, as a testimony to those who don't know Christ, to say this is what he has done. And it's Passover that Jesus is eating with his disciples when he institutes the Lord's Supper. He takes it and he repurposes it, the Passover meal becoming the Lord's Supper. We just went through the book of Luke here at church in the last couple of months, and so I just want to go back to Luke 22. In Luke 22, we have Jesus looking forward to eating Passover. Verses 14 through 16. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus has been yearning to have the Passover with them. This is going to be his last Passover. And I want to look at four reasons this morning that Jesus, I think, was yearning to have this meal with his disciples. He was desiring it. So number one, it represented the founding of the nation of Israel. The Passover did, the original. And this represents the founding of the new Israel. It was a critical turning point. So as they celebrated Passover, yes, they were a people group, but they weren't a nation. They were an enslaved people group. And God brought them out. He used Passover as the final tool, the final plague, if you will, to bring them out of Egypt and establish them as a nation. Their destiny was being realized. 
And so in the same way, I think Jesus desired this because not only was it something to represent that, it was representing now the founding of the new Israel, the founding of this new covenant. That he was now, this was a momentous occasion, just as it was 1,500 years before when they were being rescued from slavery. This is a big deal. This is the biggest deal in history. And so Passover gave him a chance to bring that out. And it was something to be very meaningful for the disciples because they had all their lives celebrated Passover and now to understand the new meaning that's being given it and a greater meaning as the true Passover lamb has come. We know it was a national symbol for the Israelites back in Exodus chapter 12. If we read a little bit further in verse 43... And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. And then verse 47 through 49. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. So it was, a, it was a powerful symbol of them as a nation. No one was allowed to do it if they weren't a part of the nation, unless they chose to identify with Israel. So if they really wanted to take it, the, the, the point is this, if you had gone and visited Israel 2,500 years ago, let's say, and they were having Passover, you would not be invited to participate. That might seem harsh. But it wasn't because they didn't like you or didn't want you to be there. It's because this wasn't just a big celebration. This wasn't like just having a May 17th celebration where everybody's included, even a foreigner. Sure, you're welcome to be here and celebrate Norway. No, no, no. This is more than just the national symbol. This is us dedicating ourselves to our God. He, we, we believe that he has made us a nation and we are dedicated to him. And you should not take this if you're not dedicated to him. And if somebody said, oh, I'm dedicated to him. Okay. Well, be circumcised, and then you can. That has to show some dedication. Now, today, we have baptism in a way in place of circumcision. That if somebody says, hey, I, I want to take communion, I want to be part of the body of Christ, we say, all right, be baptized. Show that you truly want to walk with Christ. And so this is a symbol of being a part of the family. Baptism you do once, just as circumcision was only done once. Passover they did regularly, just as we do taking the, last, the Lord's Supper regularly. But so it was something that was very serious. And so those of you here at this church, not everyone here is a believer. And we are glad to have you with us. But we don't invite you to take, to take the Lord's Supper with us. Because that's something you should only do if you are truly dedicating and have dedicated your life to Christ. And so this was something that was important to them and it's important to us today in the same way. It's a symbol of all of those who are part of this body this community, which is an eternal bond. It's something that goes on into eternity. All right, the second reason, or a second reason, I think Jesus was yearning to eat this meal. This would be the last Passover. Now, they would keep celebrating it, but it's the last one that matters to God. For centuries, the Passover had been observed, and now the perfect lamb had come and a new covenant established. So it was a change. It was, a, again, a monumental because the relationship between God and Israel was changing here. God had called out Israel to bring forth the Messiah to bless all nations. Even back all the way to Abraham, the covenant was, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to the nations. It was always God's desire. It was not that he wanted to have one special group and everybody else didn't matter, but rather he chose to use this group to bring forth Christ in the flesh that he might pay the price for our sins that all people might have the opportunity to come to know him. And so this is the end of an era, the end of one covenant, the beginning of a new covenant. We see this represented in Jeremiah chapter 31. It's a covenant here that yields fruit. I put that title because the old covenant brought death. The old covenant, we had the law, and nobody could live up to the law. Everybody fell short. All have sinned. But this covenant, listen to, what, listen to how it actually produces fruit here. Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Wait, when is that day? The Passover. That's the day he took them by the hand to take them out of the land of Egypt. Now, this is written hundreds of years before Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. So this is a prophecy by Jeremiah saying, it's coming. A new covenant, not like that one at Passover. The co my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. So he made a covenant. The people broke it. The people broke it. The people broke it. God was faithful. They were not faithful. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant. I will put my law within them. Now, before he put the law on stone tablets, of course, those are the Ten Commandments, and of course, the Pentateuch, much of the writing and scrolls. We have Leviticus and Deuteronomy and the law of God that he gave them, right? It was external. He says, the next covenant, the law is not going to be external, it's going to be internal. And he says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's the covenant established in Christ, that no longer does he remember the sin. It's removed as far as the east is from the west because it was nailed to the cross with Jesus. And see, this covenant is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He redeems us. He reconciles us. He regenerates our conscience. He, he creates us. We're being made in the image of Christ, Romans tells us. And so as that happens, he is indwelling us with his law. So we have a, a sense by the power of the Spirit. Now, we all have room to grow. We all can see our conscience. We can all go against God. But as we walk with God and as we grow, he is transforming us. We are a new creation the old is gone, the new has come. And so it's an exciting looking forward to that new covenant that will yield fruit, where each person who's a part of that covenant will know God. See, in Israel, many people were part of the covenant, but they were breaking it. They weren't really truly abiding in God and in His law. But in the new covenant, all of those who are part of that covenant relationship, all who have put their faith in Christ, will know God, will be transformed, and will be forgiven. So I think Jesus is, is looking forward to this because this was an exciting opportunity knowing that the, the new covenant had finally come. A third reason, Jesus is giving them a meal to observe even after he ascends. So just like Passover was something they did in memory to remember, to look back, so the Lord's Supper will be something for his followers to institute to look back and to remember what he has done. Luke, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So just as killing the lamb and celebrating Passover was reminding them of what God had done, killing the firstborn and bringing them out of Egypt, and so as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we are reminded of Christ's sacrifice, the pain in his body, the sacrifice on the cross, and the blood that he shed for us. And we'll read that again in a few minutes. So I think Jesus was excited to give them this ordinance, as we would call it, to look at. So he, we had baptism, which he'd given them. And of course, he says in the, great, in, the, in the Great Commission to go and make disciples, baptize them. And he gave us the Lord's Supper. These are two key ordinances that basically all Christians around the world agree on. There are all kinds of differences in doctrine and how we handle church or end times and different things. But basically, every Christian will agree Baptism and the Lord's Supper are important. Jesus gave us these, and these unite us as Christians, even from different denominations and backgrounds and beliefs. We're united in Christ, because ultimately He is the only perfect one, the Holy One, in whom we find our identity, and we realize no matter anything else that we know or have right or wrong, it's only because of Him and the grace of God that we can be saved. And so it humbles us as we take this, this bread, and this is one of the things the church in Corinth got wrong, because the rich were getting more food and the poor not getting food. And see, it's one of these things that is, it humbles us, because it's simple bread. We didn't bring you any, like, fancy garlic bread today that's hot and yummy. I'm sorry if you're looking forward to that. And we didn't bring you any really expensive wine either. But I'm glad that we don't. Because, to me, this reminds us, it's, it's humble. 
and it humbles each of us. It doesn't matter if you are the poorest person in the church, if you're the richest person in Norway, if you're here today, we share in the same bread and the same cup. We are equal before Christ. It doesn't matter if you can give loads of money as the rich Pharisees were proud to do, or whether you have two coins that you give, we're equal before Christ. And so as you take that bread and you look around, and you might be thinking sometimes, oh, I feel like I'm not as good as that person or them, and I'm not on the gifts they have, or I'm not as spiritual as them. You're equal before Christ. And if on the other hand you're looking around going, oh God, I thank you, I'm not like that person and that person, and well, humble yourself because that doesn't mean that God loves you anymore. You're equal before Christ. And so it's a, it's a powerful symbol to humble us and help us remember in, in all the things we maybe pride ourselves or doubt ourselves in, in all the things we're self-conscious in and question ourselves. So whether it's pride or self-doubt or anything else, ultimately we're equal in Christ. And my last reason for you today, I think he was yearning to eat this because I think it may look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It definitely looks forward to a celebration in the future coming, of the ultimate coming of the kingdom, when all is revealed, when the book of life is open, when all that, it, we, we talked about this last few weeks, about the kingdom. If you've been watching online, and if you haven't, you can always go back and watch it. But we've been talking about God's overarching purpose of the kingdom, not simply to restore Israel as a nation, but to restore the garden from the beginning. That's his goal. The act of perfection that he wanted, that he had desired. And it definitely looks forward to that. Jesus himself says in Luke 22, verse 18, For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And so it looks forward to that. It's a reminder of what we will have. And while it's a very humble now, what we look forward to is something very, very exciting. The Bible records, the mar it mentions the marriage supper in Revelation chapter 19, Verses 6 through 9, where we read, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Jesus says, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. I think it's a picture it looks forward to. Remember the wedding at Cana? The wedding can last days. It was quite the celebration. And we look forward to that feast, for the celebration. As we know, the day will come when the Lamb returns, when this throne is established. And so I hope we can reflect on these things today, as we'll take the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. All four of these are, are wonderful reminders to us of what it means. We don't want to do this and it becomes so habitual that it loses its meaning. That can happen too. That's the risk of rituals. That they become almost a superstition or just a habit. And so that's why I wanted to bring these things out today. Just to help us contemplate a little bit. To remember as we take this, the promise we have that goes back to Abraham. The joy and thankfulness we have that Israel was used by God to bring about the Passover lamb. Jesus the Christ. The fact that they were in an old covenant and we are now in this new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied. That Jesus wanted us to remember him and so we do this in obedience to Christ. And it reminds us that we are all equal before him. That as he was broken to pieces, his bread, and his body was broken, so we are united as one. And so in our unity, in our community, he is glorified and he is seen as visible to the world around us as we celebrate this in love as the church did in Acts, not like the church in Corinth, I hope. And as we realize it also looks forward, it looks forward to the great feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, a time of, of celebration when all is made right. So we'll be reading in a moment out of 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, but what I want to do first is I want to give us a minute of silent prayer 
while we're doing the silent, I'm going to pray, and then we'll have a, a minute or two of silent prayer, and I'm going to uncover the elements. When you feel ready, go ahead and come up to one or the other and get both the bread and the juice and take it back to your seat and wait until everyone is ready. You can, of course, come as a family, but please give distance between anyone who you're not living with so you've got the distance there. And then just take it back to your seat. If you don't feel that you're ready to take communion, then, of course, as I said earlier, we only want those who have placed their faith in Christ to come and to take it. I will then read Psalm 118 after we've had a couple minutes of prayer, of silent prayer. If you feel like, if you've not coming out in the elements, come up while I'm reading. That is fine. But by the time I've finished reading Psalm 118, I hope everyone has the elements, and then we'll go in to the Lord's Supper. So let's pray. Father, we, we can't really comprehend all of the meaning that is in this meal that we have. Something so simple and yet so deep. Something that has gone on for ages, that is from a time for us that is of antiquity. Something 2,000 years ago and yet so relevant for today. But God, I just ask that you would speak to us now in the silence. As we are going to be still before you and know that you are God, may we hear from you. May you impress on our hearts just the magnitude of what you have done for us, of who you are, and who we are in you. Not because of anything we have done, but because of what you have done, because of your great love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. 
The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God, as we read this psalm, that those in Israel would have likely read after they finished the Passover meal, we're just reminded that your love endures forever and you have become our salvation and we thank you for this is the day you have made and we rejoice and we are glad in it, Father. Even though we may have struggles and difficulties in life, there may be things that aren't going our way, there may be all sorts of things we could choose to complain about, but yet this is the day you have made. We choose to rejoice in it because ultimately what you have done and what you did on the cross overshadows any of the minor issues and struggles we may have now. We know you will give us success, victory, salvation, that we will not die but live to extol your deeds. We pray, Father, that you would help our hearts to be right before you as we come before the table today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Paul, after those verses we read earlier, he says what he received from Jesus about the night when he was betrayed, how he'd taken bread in the Last Supper. And so we'll read this now as we take the Lord's Supper. He says in verse 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. So let's take the bread now. He'd given thanks. Let us give thanks, and then we will break it and we'll eat after we read the next line here. God, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you gave your body. We know that you didn't desire this in and of yourself, that you were sweating blood, saying, can this cup pass through me? And yet you did it anyway for the joy set before you, as Hebrews tells us. But God, you did for us what we could not do for ourselves, what we perhaps would not do for ourselves. So we thank you for all that you incurred and the fact that you even took on a body of flesh and walked among us. You got in the dirt with us. You were born and you lived and you, you dealt with affliction. You saw what it was like. And so we thank you for leading us and being a part of, of our lives. It's in Jesus' name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. Let's take a moment to thank him for the blood he shed. Father, we thank you for this cup that we can drink of freely, that we can even enjoy the taste of, and, and it can be a pleasant experience, and yet we know that you shedding your blood was not pleasant. You allowed the life to be drained out of you. You faced death so that we would not have to face the second death, and you conquered death and the grave. And so we thank you for the sacrifice. You chose willingly to go to the cross. They, you were mocked and taunted. You could save yourself, and yet you could have saved yourself. 
but you chose not to. And so we thank you for your sacrifice, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray as the music team comes back up for a final song of response. During the last song, if you feel led to sing and stand, you're welcome to. If you want to remain in prayer and seated, feel free to respond to the Lord as you feel prompted. Father, we do this in remembrance of you to proclaim your death. We proclaim your death to the forces of evil around us, to say to the spiritual realm that we are no longer enslaved to our flesh, we no longer serve the powers of evil, that all the serpent tried to do in the garden is being undone on the cross. We proclaim to one another to encourage each other in our faith, that even at times our faith may be weak and we may struggle, but we're here for each other to say, yes, we're in this together. We proclaim it to the world to say that to them that we invite them to come, to put their faith in Jesus, that he offers something better, a life that's abundant and a life that's everlasting, a life that will be able to enjoy the fellowship with you forevermore as opposed to separation from you. Father, we pray for those that don't know you, whether they're here or other places, that you would impress yourself on their hearts that they might come to know you. I pray for those of us who do know you, that we would walk in accordance with the calling that we have received, Father that we might honor you in all we do, that the things we do would not be secular but sacred because we do them to glorify you, that many lives might be changed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.